So, what is a mummy's favorite type of music? Rap. Please don't click away. So when I was about eight years old, I got this book at a book fair. Return of the Mummy by R.L. Stein, book number 23 in his now infamous Goosebumps series. I've obviously had this copy for a while, and I don't know if you guys can tell on camera, but it's seen better days. But I did get it autographed last year when I met R.L. Stein at a writing conference, which I will always take any opportunity to talk about. Anyway, reading this book at age eight kicked off a phase in me that a lot of kids go through. The fascination with mummies, specifically the ones of ancient Egypt. Even if you're not super into Egyptian mummies or never were, you've probably at least heard of the mummy's curse. But do mummies really return from the dead to exact revenge on those who disturb what's supposed to be their final resting place? Let's find out. Mummies have certainly had their time in the pop culture spotlight. Even though they go in and out of fashion just like any other trend, you're almost certainly familiar with the old mummy movies as well as some of the newer ones. Even though the latest attempt to bring vengeful mummies to the big screen was um, not that successful, mummies have clearly earned their spot in movie history. Everyone's familiar with the tropes. An archaeologist or a team of archaeologists discover the grand tomb of some long-lost prince or princess and are certain this discovery will put them on the map. But apparently the mummy himself or herself isn't too happy about this. So unhappy in fact that they return from the dead to exact their revenge on those who disturbed their tomb. But where did this curse originate? People have been fascinated with Egyptian mummies for at least a hundred years, but the origins of this interest started out a little bit less respectful than what we're used to. Mummy unwrappings were pretty common in Victorian England. These live shows were exactly what they sounded like. Mummies would be brought out on stage and unwrapped for the audience. These unwrappings were held at places like theaters and universities and often sold out. You know, sometimes people give me grief for spending as much money as I do on concert tickets. But if I can pay my own money to see Niall Horan live, I think that's a little bit more ethical than paying to see someone's body being desecrated for entertainment. By the way, I didn't realize until after I wrote this script that I was talking about Niall Horan in a video about mummies from Egypt where the Nile River is. Nile. Nile. Look, you guys stuck around for the first bad joke. You should expect this by now. Mummies also found their way into fiction during this time. In 1869, Little Women author Louisa May Alcott penned the short story called Lost in a Pyramid or The Mummy's Curse. Dracula author Bram Stoker also tried his hand at mummy fiction with The Jewel of the Seven Stars, published in 1903. But as far as I could tell, nobody really believed in any sort of mummy's curse. Maybe some people saw these unwrappings as unethical and imagined mummies returning from the dead to exact revenge on those who desecrated their corpses. But these stories of the vengeful undead were largely confined to fiction. Nobody thought mummies were going to do this to real people. The real origins of this mummy's curse seem to have originated in 1922 with one of the biggest archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. British archaeologist Howard Carter began his work in Egypt in 1891. Early in his career, he worked on an excavation of Amarna, a city built by a controversial pharaoh named Akhenaten. It might have been here that he first heard about Akhenaten's son and successor, King Tutankhamun. Just after World War I, Carter began searching for Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt's famous Valley of the Kings. Tutankhamun, often referred to today as King Tut, was a relatively obscure king in his day, but his reign was marked by what came before it. Like I said earlier, Akhenaten, who was Tutankhamun's successor and probably his father, was pretty controversial. 
Unlike other Egyptians who worshipped many gods, Akhenaten only worshipped one, the sun god, Aten. Akhenaten built new temples for the worship of Aten and forbid worship of any other gods. Even Tut's birth name, Tutankhaten, means the living image of Aten. For many Egyptians who had always worshipped the gods that it was now illegal to worship, this change didn't go over so well. Akhenaten died in 1333 BC, at which point Tut took over the throne at the ripe old age of nine. With the help of an advisor named Ai, Tut worked to undo everything his father had done. He ordered repairs of the old god's temples, reversed the decree that said Egyptians had to worship Aten, and moved the capital back to Thebes from Amarna. But other than restoring Egypt back to the way it had been, or at least trying, Tut didn't accomplish much in his short reign, which ended with his death in 1324 BC at the age of 19, roughly. Some historians think he was 18. It's hard to say for sure. The size of Tut's tomb would later suggest he probably died unexpectedly. Theories about what actually killed him range from a hippo attack to a chariot crash to straight up murder. Another more likely explanation is that his death resulted from physical deformities that resulted due to him being the product of incest. Regardless of how Tut died, he left no heirs. His wife had given birth to two girls who are assumed to be twins, but unfortunately they were stillborn. Their remains would later be found in Tut's tomb. Tut was succeeded on the throne by his advisor, I, who also later married his wife. I think that's where the murder theory came from. People thought that I killed Tut so he could marry Tut's wife, but that's just speculation. Later on, one of Tut's former generals, Horembeb, became pharaoh and had monuments to Tut destroyed and his name stricken from records. This was apparently pretty common in that day, and it might be at least one of the reasons why Tut was relatively unknown when Carter began his search, but it wouldn't remain that way for long. Earlier in 1922, Carter had been approached by Lord Carnarvon, who had been funding the expedition. Carnarvon actually didn't want to finance it anymore because it was going nowhere, but Carter begged him to reconsider, and Carnarvon agreed to stay on for one more season. Carter resumed digging on November 1st, 1922. Then, on November 26th, Carter and his team got the lucky break they were looking for. They had discovered the antechamber of the tomb, which was basically described as a hallway outside the actual, still sealed, burial chamber. Carter contacted Lord Carnarvon, who was at his home in London at the time, but agreed to travel to Egypt for the actual unsealing of the tomb. But the same day the antechamber was discovered, Carnarvon's pet canary was killed by a cobra. Most sources say the bird was actually eaten by the cobra, but one said that it was just attacked by the cobra and later died of fright. But whatever actually happened, this was seen by a lot of people as a bad omen. But the team didn't pay this any attention. They'd spent too much time and money to quit now. On February 16th, 1923, Howard Carter, Lord Carnarvon, and the rest of the team entered Tut's burial chamber. As Carter went in, Lord Carnarvon asked, can you see anything? Carter replied, yes, wonderful things. The tomb was filled with treasure, furniture, chariots, weapons, even some of Tut's walking sticks. Tut's body was housed inside three coffins and covered by the famous gold mask you've probably seen before. This mask is made from more than 22 pounds of gold and gemstones. This discovery was stunning, of course, not just because of the treasure, but because it was one of the only tombs of this sort to be discovered intact. Grave robbing was a problem that plagued ancient Egypt and most of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings had been cleaned out long ago. Tut's tomb had been entered earlier, probably by these ancient grave robbers. They did take some things, but for whatever reason, didn't enter the actual burial chamber. 
It's been speculated that they didn't get this far because Tut was such an obscure pharaoh and his tomb was so small and well hidden that they just assumed there wasn't much in there. But the joy of this discovery was short-lived. Not long afterward, Lord Carnarvon was bitten by a mosquito on his cheek, a bite that later became infected. He contracted blood poisoning and died on April 5th, 1923 just a couple of months after the burial chamber was opened. The night he died, all the lights in Cairo went out at the same time. About a month before Carnarvon's death, author Marie Corelli wrote to the New York Times about a quote she'd found in a book. The quote read, Death comes on wings to he who enters the tomb of a pharaoh. Now that Tut's final resting place had been disturbed, Corelli was afraid of a curse being placed on those who were associated with the opening of the tomb. Lord Carnarvon, of course, died not too long after this. A few days after his death, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, famous for works like The Lost World and the Sherlock Holmes series, said he believed Carnarvon's death was the result of a curse. And there were plenty of suspicious deaths in the following months and years of people who had either been at the opening of the tomb or were somehow associated with it. On May 17, 1923, wealthy railroad tycoon George Gould died in his villa in France, supposedly from pneumonia. Gould had reportedly visited Tut's tomb and contracted pneumonia while in Egypt. Another death attributed to the curse was Prince Ali Kamal Fami Bey. This Egyptian prince was killed by his wife on July 10th, 1923, just after visiting Tut's tomb himself. Lord Carnarvon's half-brother, Aubrey Herbert, also died later that year of blood poisoning after a routine dental operation went wrong. Howard Carter's personal secretary, Captain Richard Bethel, was found in his bed of an apparent smothering on November 15, 1929. Bethel had also given some of the artifacts from Tut's tomb to his father, Lord Westbury, who supposedly jumped to his death from the seventh floor of his apartment building on February 20, 1930. Another member of Carter's team supposedly died of arsenic poisoning, and one of the radiologists who x-rayed Tut's mummy died mysteriously as well, but I couldn't find any other details on these deaths. It's difficult to say exactly how many people died as a result of the curse, since whether the curse even exists is up for debate, but I've seen estimates as low as 6 and as high as 20. Meanwhile, Howard Carter, the leader of the expedition, spent the years after the discovery of the tomb cataloging all of the artifacts. Some sources say it took him up to 10 years, others say it took him the rest of his life. He died in 1939 at the age of 66, 17 years after making the discovery of the century. Today, Tut's body lies in its original resting place in the Valley of the Kings in a climate-controlled coffin. His famous death mask is at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Other artifacts from his tomb are currently on tour, as odd as that sounds. The tour was in Los Angeles for a while and then Paris. The Paris leg of the tour just concluded on September 22, 2019, which was just a couple of weeks ago as of me filming. The tour is set to be in London from November 2019 to May 2020. After that, the artifacts will go to Giza's Grand Egyptian Museum, which is set to open in 2020. So now you know the story of the discovery of Tut's tomb and the unusual deaths that came after it. But was there really a curse? At one point, a scientific explanation was proposed for these deaths. Some mummies carried molds like Aspergillus niger and Aspergillus flavus. These molds can supposedly cause congestion or bleeding in the lungs. Also found in some old tombs are bacteria like Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus, which can attack the lungs. These things sound dangerous, but... Nobody, scientist or tourist, has had any sort of illness or death that resulted from interactions with these fungi or bacteria. There is another interesting theory I found. In 2012, London's curse, 
Murder, Black Magic, and Tutankhamun in the 1920s West End was released. The book's author, Mark Bainan, suggested that some of these deaths were actually the work of famous occultist Aleister Crowley. Crowley's own religious beliefs were inspired by the religion of ancient Egypt. According to this theory, Crowley would have seen the excavation of Tut's tomb as sacrilegious and wanted revenge. This sounds a bit far-fetched to me, but I thought it was interesting enough to share. And if you'd like to check the book out for yourself, links as always will be down below. But the most logical explanation for the curse is that there really isn't an explanation. When you take a harder look at these deaths, some of them start to make more sense in context, and the idea of a curse becomes a lot less likely. The first supposed victim of this curse was, of course, Laura Carnarvon, who financed the expedition. Carnarvon died of blood poisoning as a result of a mosquito bite on his cheek that became infected. This sounds strange on the surface, but Laura Carnarvon had actually been in pretty bad health for a while. In fact, he spent as much time in Egypt as he did in order to avoid the damp, cold climate of his native England. I couldn't find many details about his health, but apparently a lot of these issues stemmed from a car accident he'd had in Germany earlier in his life. As for the blackout at the time of his death, it was probably a coincidence. Blackouts in Egypt are still pretty common, even today. Every now and then you'll also hear of blackouts in major areas like New York City. There was one as recently as July 2019. Now let's briefly go back and look at the death of Lord Westbury, the son of Howard Carter's personal secretary, who supposedly jumped to his death after being given artifacts from Tut's tomb. Suicide is obviously a very serious subject, and it's very complex, caused by more than one factor. We don't know much about what was going on in Lord Westbury's life at the time of his death, but I do wonder if the death of his son a few months earlier was a contributing factor. Again, suicide is very complex, and I don't want to point to just one specific incident to explain everything. But it seems like this death might be more about personal tragedy than a curse. All in all, depending on what sources you look at, somewhere between 6 and 20 people died over the next few years as a result of this curse. This does seem like a pretty high number, but again, it is just an estimate. And again, we don't know what was going on in these people's lives at the time of their deaths. The last survivor who was present at the opening of Tut's tomb died in 1961. Dr. John Ora Kinneman was an archaeologist on Carter's expedition and died of an illness at the age of 84. Hardly a premature death. But in my opinion, one of the strongest indicators that there wasn't a curse was the leader of the expedition himself. Not only was it Howard Carter's idea to disturb Tut's tomb in the first place, but he's also said to have basically hacked up Tut's mummy in the years afterwards for the sake of science. Just like Lord Carnarvon, Carter had been in poor health for pretty much all of his life. You think if anyone would be the victim of a curse-induced premature death, it would be him. Yet he lived another 17 years after the tomb was opened. So there are a few mysterious deaths that I couldn't find much information on. Could they be the result of a curse? Possibly. But the fact that the leader of Tut's tomb robbing himself, Howard Carter, didn't seem to be a victim is enough to make me skeptical. One of the sources I looked at for information in this video is a book called Raising the Dead. During the book's section on the mummy's curse, author Daniel Cohen gives another great reason as to why the curse probably isn't real. Even if Tut could exact revenge from the grave, he didn't really have any motivation to do so. One thing that was very important to an Egyptian was that his name be remembered. That, in some way, helped to assure immortality. Many funerary inscriptions read, To speak the name of the dead is to make them live again, for it restores the breath of life to him who has vanished. Prayers inscribed on the outside of the tombs often exhorted the passerby to speak the name of the man buried within. Sometimes, where there was a political upheaval, the new ruler would try to obliterate the name of his hated predecessor by having the name cut out of all royal inscriptions. That was considered the ultimate punishment and revenge. It was a fate that King Tut suffered, 
and is one reason why so little was known about him. By finding King Tut's tomb, Carter and Carnarvon made sure that the name of this obscure and otherwise unknown king would be remembered and spoken of throughout the entire world some 4,000 years after his death. Far from placing a curse on them, he should have granted them three wishes. But none of this has stopped the story of the mummy's curse from blowing up. The story is so ingrained in pop culture, it was hard for me to find information about the actual curse. Most of the initial search results showed things like movies or games, including a 1944 movie called The Mummy's Curse, which I'm pretty sure I've seen before. I don't think I need to explain why the story of the curse is a lot more compelling than what actually probably happened. Looking at it from the mummy's perspective in these stories, you can see why they're upset. After all, if you were still sentient after your death and someone broke into what was basically your home and tried to steal your stuff, maybe even desecrate your corpse, you'd be pretty upset too. And of course, there is the fact that dead bodies, especially 3,000-year-old mummies, look pretty terrifying. This is what King Tut's mummy looked like when all was said and done. No disrespect intended to the boy king, but when I was a kid, that was the stuff nightmares were made of. If anyone's going to come back from the dead and try to kill me, it's going to be this guy. So as always, I am curious to know what you guys think. Do you think there's really a mummy's curse? Also, what's your favorite mummy movie? Being a child of the 90s, I really enjoyed the 1999 movie The Mummy, which of course was a remake of one of the classic Universal monster movies. I was about 10 or 11 when I first saw it and I was terrified. Now of course I think it's hilarious. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content, I hope that you will consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Thanks so much for watching and have a creepy day. Bye guys.